Okay, so let's talk Mormonism now. So you're you're like Mormons, successful rock band. You're yeah. like the new version of the Osmonds, <laughs> but like you know, but 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 modern, right? So you're carrying that like all these hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of Mormons are like, oh, that's us, that's our band. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, and, and I, you know what, I still proudly carry that. You know, to, yeah, and I, I culturally, I, I. Born I, Mormon, I would, you know, you can't, you can't get that out of your blood, and so, I, st I still really appreciate that, and I, I'm, I definitely hear what you're saying as, as far as that, you know, like, is there so, a part when, of you like representing Mormonism and the priesthood when you're like being successful to the world? Part well, of you that? feel you just feel the mantle of that. You feel like you know, it's like I'm re representing my people in a way, and you want to do right by them, and it's it, it, it's it's like an extra, done, you know, you don't want to disappoint them, and it's like, yeah, I think there's a little extra thing there, and. Uh, that's, you know, part of my trepidation of like speaking out too is like, is that I know that, you know, people like, you know, Brand from the Killers, Neon Trees and uh, us. You know, also uh, the Panic at the Disco, Panic right? Panic at the Disco. He, well, he, he was raised that way. I, right. think, I don't think he yeah is much into it now. But, you know, so you feel that sort of you're, you're taking on this, this mantle and uh, I don't want to disappoint those people. But I also, you know, it's like. At some point, I just got to, you know, be myself too. So wh when when we were, you know, early on in the band, me and Dan were still going to church, you know, we would go to church on the road. We'd find, you know, the nearest um, chapel and, you know. So while you were touring, yeah, you'd yeah. go to church? Mm -hmm. Go oh. to church. They wouldn't Dan play would on Sundays. No Sunday gigs. What? Yeah. Say no to everything time. but Sunday Yep. Sunday gigs. Sunday, yeah, say yes to everything but Sunday gigs. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> uh, and, uh, right, sorry. Yeah, say and, yes to um, everything. Yeah, we were still, still, still with it, and still, you know, we consider ourselves Mormon. You know, I, Dan is definitely has his own path as far as where he's at with everything right now. But you know, we're we're pretty aligned as far as like our, our thoughts on things. But so when um, you hit big, were you had the had the big crack started to emerge in your testimony or faith? No. Okay. So you so. You're hitting it big. You're still like into the Mormon thing yep, fully. Yep. Okay. You know, okay. it's like I'm not like the most, like uh, I'm not the best, but I'm I'm in there. I'm doing my best. I'm not drinking or, you know, doing any of the typical rock star things. You know, you know, uh, actually being faithful to, to your wife on the road, <laughs> that kind of stuff. Appreciate you. Uh, so not the mo not the most typical. No drugs or you know, just both living clean and and trying to do this thing our way and pr probably not, you know, at the risk of looking cool to probably other bands and, uh, you know, no tattoos. And I'm sure it's, 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 it's probably a strange juxtaposition for people, but it's, it's the truth of who we were. And so we did it. Did you ever feel like, well, God did this or we were blessed by God, like, or, or I guess you worked so hard for so long, it'd yeah. probably be hard to attribute it to anything other than hard work, right? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, okay. Okay. I, Perhaps I lived in, you know, in a world that God created that if you work hard, <laughs> okay. this kind of stuff can happen. So thanks God for you know, making this <laughs> the happen. The context. Yeah, and yeah. then also you just think of all the other Mormon bands that were playing Vlore that we knew and loved and that weren't having that success. So that almost, yeah, it's like, oh, okay, they weren't as God bless you, but not right. them. Yeah, right. it just doesn't really work that way. So, okay, okay. So what happened? So yeah, so I was still in it. Uh, we were being faithful and I, I don't, as we got married and stuff, we would go to church, but our temple attendance probably wasn't all that great. We weren't really going that much anymore. And just sort of, there was just some things I think were under the surface. I think Prop 8 was an issue for both of us, even though we never really talked about it a ton. The discussions we did have it were like, you know, if, if this can be seen as anything less than a complete, you know, blunder. <laughs> blunder. <laughs> You know, for, for have you had gay friends or lesbian yeah, friends or LGBT? Of course, yeah. I had trans a lot friends while yeah. dancing. I had a lot of gay friends, and that was a really hard time for me to just kind of brush off. You were in California during Prop yeah. Eight, right? I want to say I was at BYU, okay. but I was coming back and forth. Okay, and I still had those friends. I I had gay friends at BYU as well who were in the closet. But yeah, it was really difficult. It was really, even my family in California, my siblings were still in high school and stuff. And they, the church asked a lot of them to go door to door. And my parents didn't really feel comfortable with that because they, I mean, I, I don't know exactly where they stood with it, but they didn't feel good about them promoting that. 
And yeah, I I really hated it. I really hated it a lot. Yeah, you I, disagreed with it? You thought it was wrong? 100%. You didn't feel like, you didn't have a testimony of it? No. Okay. No. Yeah, I, I hated it on two levels. First of all, I hated it for the obvious reason of um, its treatment of gay people, obviously. And then I hated it also because I'm a big church state dividing line kind of guy. You're a libertarian. And the fact that a tax exempt organization would try and meddle so overtly in uh, political matters, it was, it was, that upset me. So I was, I was kind of like, I'm still with, like, I'm still cool, but like, that was like a real big chink for me is like, what's happening? How could this be revelation from God? We're not writing Facebook posts about it or being public about it, but I think it was in the underbelly of... I guess starting things crumbling yeah, a little and, bit. And then like, you know, like Alex already mentioned, the treatment of women in the church, you know, um, I feel like I always felt like the church was missing out on about half of its potential by the way it treated its women and uh, that women weren't uh, ever seen as equal despite the protests of those who think they are. Um so, as far as leader position, leadership positions and, and just living out their potential in the church, I don't think that it was a, it was a 50-50 deal. And anyone who says so, I, I strongly disagree with. So let me just set this up a tiny bit. So there, there are always going to be people that don't really want to hear your story and listen mm-hmm. who are orthodox or devout. And they're going to go, well, rock star. You, you become a rock star, you become prideful, you're going to leave the church because that's what happens when you get successful, you become prideful. Mm-hmm. You're talking about stuff that happens four years before you ever hit. Yeah. Right. And so I, I want to bring that in. Right. So you're saying that some of your doubts and concerns happened that were legitimate, were weighing on your mind years before you had any indication you'd ever make it. Totally. Is that right? Yes. And we're having these doubts now, I guess, bringing it back to around when the band is hitting big and... We're not really talking about it, the two of us, but I can feel that neither of us are really wanting to go to church. We don't feel comfortable when we go there with what's being said. However, I, at least I, I, I don't want to speak for you, but I think you felt the same way. We just did not want to become that cliche of, <laughs> of a quote unquote rock star who? who then leaves the church. Like all the actors that the church claims they grew up Mormon, but you know, look at them now. You know, and so I think we're really fearful of that. And so it almost made us want to like white knuckle a little bit and make sure we made it to every cousin wedding in the temple. And plus, you want to let everyone down, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. People you love and who look up to you, right? Yeah. Yeah. And just inside, I mean, even yes to the outside world, we didn't want to be a cliche, but inside, it just seemed like no, the church can't or the world can't bring us down that way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And if, you know, it really was, so I think basically the turning point for us was uh, this all kind of coincided with our second album, Smoke and Mirrors, and that album is, you know, uh, it's not even trying to be subtle and it, and it's what it means, you know. Tell us some of the songs on that album. Uh, Smoke and Mirrors is the is the title track, and it's it's you know I think it's Dan r- grappling with his own faith, cons- you know, faith crisis of some kind, you know, or at least seeing things differently than he used to and not sure not being sure of where he's ending up and i echoed it you know we talked about it quite a bit me and so dan. before the album it's like let's do a faith crisis album or not no not at all okay that's not how dan well, writes okay uh, well he's he's incapable of it. i think for him it's just like stream of consciousness sort of like oh look like he finds out after the song was written what it was about mm-hmm. you know and so you know even the lyrics and smoke and mirrors like all i believe is it just smoke and mirrors like that's kind of, you know, it, it tells you a little bit about where we were. And so that kind of coincides with like, where are we going to um, end up in the church? And like, just the first time of being like unsure. And I think even more so the, the, when you have your own children, because we both Diana, Dan and I had started to have our own kids. And I'm sure you probably heard this a lot that when you start to have your own children and you look them in the eye and you see them as these completely empty vessels that you fill with whatever you will. You have to, that's when you really have to ask yourself, like, what do you believe and what are you going to imprint on your kids? Cause you're responsible for them. And that's the first time I ever had to really look inside myself and say, are you going to teach your kid about Mormonism? Are you going to teach them about 
Joseph Smith, are you, there's no half ass in this. It's like, that's not my personality. I'm either going to do it or not do it. And so either he's going to primary and he's going to sing about following the prophet or he's not. And so I think as a couple, we were both just like, what's happening? I'm tired of this in between. I hate fence sitting. I hate being unsure about where we stand and all these issues we're having. So let's, let's figure it out. Yeah. It's like, we talk about everything and that was kind of a subject we weren't talking about. And it's, so it almost felt like this little gap. And so I, I'm glad that we addressed it and, you know, shit started to go down. <laughs> what? So what happened? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. What? <laughs> so was it like, oh, Dan, you hear, Dan plays a song for you for the album and you're like, wait, is this about your faith crisis? Like, no, we never, oh, there was never anything explicit about no. that. So you, it's just you two having kids and then starting to talk for the first time. Yeah. It just happened to coincide with that sort of time period. It's kind of interesting. I'm just, I was just thinking, reflecting on it. Did one of you say to the other, I may not believe it's all true. Was there sort of a coming out for either of you to the other? Well, I mean, it's like, I, I feel like we, we had our son River, our firstborn, and then a year and a half later, we had our second son, Wolf. And I feel like in that time, it's like we just, we blessed our first baby in the church, but we hadn't really been to that ward. It was just like, Where Hi. was this? In Huntington Beach. Okay. Mm -hmm. and so it's kind of like, hi, we're coming and we're going to bless our baby because we're in this ward, but we've been traveling so much, which we had, but you still, you know, you make it. You know, so it was kind of like, oh, we hadn't been in a little bit. And so he did a lovely blessing of our son. And then that year we, uh, they did the album, Smoke and Mirrors. We started traveling with our son. And then very soon after we got pregnant with our second son. And when we came to bless him, we just didn't feel comfortable doing it in a ward building. But we weren't ready to, I guess, give up the ghost or whatever of what Mormonism was because we didn't really know where we were with it. So we blessed the baby at home. It's also lovely. And then we just started to be like, okay, like let's actually talk about this. And are we going to fence it our whole life? Because that's not what we do in any other part of our life. So why would we do it on what's technically supposed to be the most important part of our life, which is our religion. So let's do some research and make a decision. Yeah. One way or another, like I wasn't being a good priesthood holder. You know, I felt like, I was kind of uh, lax in my priesthood responsibilities. And so it's like either I... Meaning I'm, like having a calling, doing your home yeah, teaching? Yeah, going and calling, you know, feeling like I'm worthy to give a blessing. And like, am I really like a good priesthood holder? And am I confident in my own ability to have the priesthood and all that stuff? So yeah, it just ended up being like one way or another, we're going to figure this out. And honestly, we kind of thought we would end up on the side of going to church and just going back and, and, uh, being full in. And at least that was my expectation of it. And, and then, uh, so around what year is this? Two, two thir 14. 13, 14, 14. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Beginning of 2014. So how did you go? How did you go down the road of investigation? Who started? Or guess the, the Utah Mormon or the California Mormon, John. <laughs> Either one. Get, do, do both. Let's do both. The no, sinner. guess guess which one of the two. You know, <laughs> you're. Oh, it's oh. Obviously. Oh. I've got sin all over me. Now the, all the sermons are like, so it's her fault. <laughs> that, no, right. That I'm was out. my first mistake marrying a California Mormon. <laughs> yeah, because your dad raised you liberal <laughs> and. Don't raise your kids liberal if right? you want them to. Actually, that's actually not true. I've found the kids that were raised more orthodox and conservative are the ones that was too rigid and it right. broke. The right. ones who were usually raised progressive, they had a more flexible faith, and so they were able to stay. So yeah. I'm just telling you, my experience, it was right. it's the opposite right. that's true. But mm. anyway. But surprise. Surprise. <laughs> <laughs> I'm special. So, no, um, yeah, I was talking with a cousin of mine that I'm close with about it. Uh, we actually went to BYU together and oh, I hope that's not too much information. <laughs> um, and you know, she mentioned Mormon stories and I was thinking it was like, Oh, stories of Mormons, <laughs> you know, like that'll that's really help. get you. Yeah, exactly. Oh. You know, it was just such a <laughs> nice, positive title. I just like stories. <laughs> I, just, I do too. So I wanted to listen to them. And so I just listened to the most recent episode and it was someone that was recently um, excommunicated, I want to say, or they had just had a, 
Like the Calderwoods, Marisa and Carson Calderwood, or Rock Waterman, it, or maybe it. I honestly, it was just fourteen. T- yeah, 13, does, like mm-hmm. like Denver Snuffer was excommunicated in 2000, 2013. Uh-huh. Kate Kelly was excommunicated in two thousand fourteen. Yeah, and that's when Rock Waterman and the Calderwoods and others started getting excommunicated. Maybe yeah, it was just yeah. one man on there, okay. and it's probably Rock Waterman. And I feel like it was like a part two because I I never mm-hmm. really listened to podcasts what before. His yeah, disciplinary council. Exactly. So I right. just kind of clicked on that, and so it was kind of in the middle of a story. I really didn't know what was going on, but he mentioned the word CES letter. Dum dum dum. Yeah. And so uh, you know, as you do, you just I just Googled what that was, and I came home. I was out uh, grocery shopping, and I just told him, I was like, "Yeah, had you heard of this?" And you know, we looked it up and just started reading <laughs> together. That's interesting. It's really common these days to sort of say, "Well, Jeremy Runnels like was dishonest, and he was trying to hurt people, and." The CES letter is disingenuous and it's hiding things and it's introducing problems. And there's always this tendency to attack the messenger. Mm -hmm. How did you guys, how did and do you think about the CES letter? Because it has been demonized because it's played an important role in people learning. Mm -hmm. Right? In education. (laughs) Which is the worst. Um, Yeah, do you want to take it? I mean, yeah, I devoured the whole thing in three hours. Wow. It's 70 pages. Yeah, I just swallowed it whole. And, and what was uh, it like? What was that I like? cross-referenced everything and looked at all the references. He was, was this from. all new to you? Was this all? Yes. In 2014, that's new to you. 99% of that information, I had no clue was happening. And so. And by the way, th- th- that's nine years into Mormon Story's existence mm-hmm. at this point, 2014. Wild. Like we started in 2005. So that's nine years into Mormon Story's you're a global personality hearing about these issues for the first time right. in 2014. Yes. And so uh, I was flabbergasted by the amount of information that was being kept from and members. Give, well, top five I mean, things I, that flabbergasted you. Just so not, not, we're not trying to so doubt, right. but it's important for you to say what were the things that like, I didn't know this. How, how did it happen? Like, how did I not know? I mean, that South Park was right. <laughs> About the hat, the stone in the hat and the translation. It's like, how is South Park more honest? Than, uh, I, I think, I, I don't know. I, I think I can just speak for like the, like the Utah Mormon experience. I know there's a lot of people who say, well, I, you know, I knew that stuff. And like, why are you bothered by it? Like sort of gaslighting that way. But like, I can speak for, I mean, everyone in my ward at home would be really shocked to know that Joseph Smith was arrested for treasure hunting. That he was a known treasure hunter. That was like his first foray into this kind of stuff. Uh, that would, I think, that'd be shocking to people. Um, that he did translate it, like by putting a rock in a hat and looking down at it with no plates in the with room. No, the plates were never used. So all the artwork uh, that is was depicted deceptive. Is is uh, unintentionally is or intentionally? Right. Yeah. Um, gosh. Book of know, Abraham. The Book of Abraham. The translations. Kindred plates. The um, just the overall tendency of a man who is gifted at, gifted at the art of creative borrowing. Whereas, you know, like, you know, people say the Book of Mormon couldn't have been created any other way. Well, there's like three books that are a lot like the Book of Mormon that he could have easily had access to and uh, took stuff from. And Meaning via the Hebrews? Via the Hebrews, via the, Hebrews um, the, uh, the, the late war, the late Napoleon, war. yeah. Book of Napoleon, so stuff like that. So that was all the all the sources that probably served as inspiration. That that very well could have plus and the Bible, <laughs> plus the Bible. There's a lot of the Bible and the mistranslation of the Bible, and that the fact that he, you know, translated uh, incorrectly things that he had already put in the Book of Mormon and stuff like that. Like the, you know, and I, I don't, I'm not really here to like yeah, yeah. list all of that because you've done a great job uh, going over all these points with people that are really interested to know uh, all. There's probably 50 things in there that are, should be really alarming, uh, to the, the church going, you know, every Sunday church going member that doesn't know. And was the polygamy stuff. Joseph Smith's polygamy was uh, a huge thing for me. Cause it's, oh, oh, that was always Brigham Young's thing and why it was right for him and not for Joseph. I don't really know now, but the fact that Joseph Smith was free of it was sort of like the saving grace of polygamy because Mormons do know about polygamy, but their knowledge is that it started with Brigham Young and then, went on until 
it had to stop. But the fact that Joseph Smith had, you know, over 30 wives and sister couples and mother daughter couples and uh, some that were already married to other men that were on missions and 14 year olds, 14 year olds, people that uh, were in secret that Emma didn't know about. I think this, you know, wherever you land on it, it should be, it should at least be something that you explore. And uh, I found it uh, utterly shocking and for some reason completely believable. And it's, and me and Alex both kind of like thought it was really interesting after we read it. It's like, you can read, you, you can live something your whole life. You can go to church every Sunday. You can read the scriptures every day. You can uh, do all the right, honest, faithful things that you think are true inside the church and live it. Three hours of reading something that you already know deep down has some truth to it and you can have that it can just er eradicate all that so quickly like and that goes back to like dnc it's like light is truth and it just pierces it just pierced it for me like it, it got rid of all of that that bs and I, it's just something i knew um even if half the things in this ces letter are wrong even if you take the stance that you know if you take a stance that favors the church's view on it you still have like 25 really big problems. Even, you know, even if you give a generous reading to the, to the CES letters as much as you can, you can't deny that there are serious issues that are beyond an apologetic position. And uh, I don't know what to say about it. I mean, I, it's, it was also kind of heart-wrenching too to know that all this stuff was true. And uh, I was really disappointed. The part of me was, as, as true as I knew it felt to me and as I looked up all the references and kind of gathered all, gathered all this information for myself, it was also really sad and I felt like <laughs> I felt like I was in, an, in another dimension. And I want to ask you, Alex, about your perspective, but for someone who wants to say, well, it's, it's Mormon Story's fault or it's Jeremy Runnell's fault or it's the CES letter's fault. What would you say in response to that? That, you know, that, that they're the bad guys. I'm the bad guy. Jeremy's the bad guy. CES letters robbing people's faith. What right. would you say to that? Uh, well, I think that depends on a lot of your perspective. Yeah. Uh, I think there are people that will think that, but, um, I have the opposite view of it. I, I, I think that people, anyone who's at least honest enough to want to bring questions to light and you've never, I, you never really struck me as an anti-Mormon character. You've never struck me as that people have a, a view of a person uh, when they hear anti-Mormon, like when, especially where I'm from, it's like an anti-Mormon, like that's like a core horror thing. And that, that's to be taken. These people are not, they exude darkness. You'll know when you see them. And I think it was the same for, it's the same thing for, uh, as far as like doctrine is concerned in general. So you're taught that there's Mormon doctrine and you're taught that there's anti-Mormon doctrine. And if something is not faith promoting to Mormonism, it's gonna go, it's gonna end up right in the in the uh, category of anti Mormon, but what the, the thing that you and Jeremy and other Dan Vogel and so many other people are bringing to light is that there's actually a third category, that's massive and it's called objective historical truth, and uh, no matter where you land on this stuff, you have to I think you owe it to yourself to look into it for yourself and it I think it's a door that has to be walked through by the person, and. No, nothing I say, nothing you say, or, or nothing that Jeremy writes, if the person's not ready to hear it or are not going to be open to at least the possibility that they're wrong, then it's, this isn't for them anyway, and they're probably not even engaged in this conversation, just like I wasn't for nine years after And we're we fine with that because yeah. the, the purpose of this isn't to taint like we started. Right. right. The purpose of this conversation is not to get other people out. No. But the purpose is to basically help people not feel alone and crazy and to help validate other people's experiences. Yeah. And the truth is I'm, I may be a messenger. Jeremy may be a messenger, Dan Vogel, Brent Metcalf, Michael Quinn, whoever, Carolyn Pearson were messengers, but the message is we didn't create it. Okay. <laughs> right. Yeah. We didn't create it. Right. And it's not us. No. It's the, it's the, their core problems that the church is now acknowledging through the essays, gospel topics, essays, mm -hmm. but they didn't for a long time. Right. So blame us, but it's, it's, we're, <laughs> we're just the messengers. You know what I mean? Well, I'm certainly grateful 
that you guys are doing what you're doing. You know, it wasn't as easy to do this nine years ago or however long ago you started. It was a different, it was even then it was a lot different. And uh, however much uh, support there is for people like us now, I think it was a lot less when you first started. So, oh, yeah. yeah. Alex, what was it like for you reading these things and learning these things? I mean, my first reaction was it was exhilarating, honestly. Really? Oh, because you had been waiting for that moment where it would all click for you. And yeah. By this time, you're having kids and it's not clicking yet. Exactly. How fun for you, babe. <laughs> oh, yeah. It was super easy for me. <laughs> I don't know what your problem is. No, I I felt like it's just like, oh. It makes sense. Yeah. I'm like, I wasn't crazy. You know, all this time, I'm the wrong one. I'm the sinner. I'm I'm the one that just isn't ready for this gospel that hit me over the head. I was like, oh, maybe I'm not the crazy one, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know? Maybe it's okay that it never clicked, Mm -hmm. you know? So I I found it at first. I mean, I went through kind of stages of grief after that, um, the loss of, you know, I don't know how much detail we'll get later, but, you know, the loss of, you know, my favorite concept of the church, which is eternal families, um, that was just such, that was the only thing that I really kind of held on to when I couldn't believe in anything else is just like, as long as we get to be together with our kids forever, all this mm. other stuff, it, whatever, you yeah, know, it doesn't matter. So, you know, that I went through later, but at first I just, again, I also gobbled it up and I, you know, the investigative journalist student in me just loved just diving into something that I felt was so taboo. And finally in my life, there was like nothing is really taboo, you know, I, I'm open to explore things and, um, I can be open-minded. I don't have to have a perspective that an older gentleman told me to have and a political view that an older man told me to have. I can have an opinion that feels right to me personally, and I'm not a bad person for that. Um, and I think all the villainization of Jeremy Runnels or you or anyone, it's just such a cop-out. It's just, the people are good or bad or I, you know, it's just so much more nuanced than that. And if they were to really listen or research, they would know that. And, um, you know, people aren't binary like that. And it, it feels really good to hear people that, you know, will list the positives as well as the negatives. And you can kind of come to a conclusion yourself. Right. Yeah. And then people have read this stuff and come to tough. Like I know yeah. I have a friend. Of course, bless his, I love him to death. He's a childhood friend of mine, Phil. I don't think you would care that I said his name. <laughs> and he's read. He knows everything I know. He's read the CS letter cover to cover, did all the references, and came to the conclusion that the church is still true. And he's a happy member of the church. Totally. And we argue about it all the time, and For we send fun. emails to each other, and <laughs> you know blah, 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 that kind of stuff. But That's it's great. It's like. I don't care, and he doesn't, like, we're still the same people, we're still childhood friends, and, like, the, there are people that read what we read and, and come to totally different conclusions, so I just want to state that. Sure. Yeah, no one's yep. unintelligent for coming to no, a different no. conclusion, it's Not just, and there, there's just so many factors, and there's so many ways in which Mormonism will fit or won't fit into your life, and there's really, I, there just isn't really a wrong answer with how to live your life, Yeah. as long as you're not hurting anyone. So an interesting metaphor that I've been talking about in our workshops and retreats for a long time is the Adam and Eve metaphor. And traditionally in, in the Protestant interpretation of the, of the Adam and Eve story, Eve is the temptress who eats from the tree for the, from the fruit of the tree of what? Of knowledge Mm -hmm. of good and evil. And she, 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 beseeches Adam to eat. And so in that sense, in traditional Christianity, she's viewed as the bad one, the one who tempted Adam and then made him fall, right? Right. Now, the weird thing is in Mormonism, it's flipped and that's viewed as an act of free agency and an act of enlightenment sure. and, mm-hmm. and of wisdom. So Eve's the, the, good, the good character, not the bad one. Right. For family and friends that are listening to your story, they're like, well, well Wayne lost his faith because Alex... Tempted him, right? I hope so. So, <laughs> so Wayne, if someone wanted to pin this on Alex, not me or Jeremy or whoever, or but Alex, what would you say to that? Like, uh, I can't say the words because the children might be listening. <laughs> uh, no, it was, it was. We certainly do everything together. Every every decision we, we've ever made has been together, and uh, this is something. 
it's like I you wouldn't you wouldn't pin this on any one of like any one of us. It was it was a, it was a group effort. We we pulled each other down equally. I would say. Yeah, <laughs> and also just I I just don't really care about people who judge a situation falsely. I just yeah I don't care if you think that that's not what happened and that's okay. So what did happen from your perspective? Um, I mean, I think it's. I think you just uh, took a step. You took. You, you were brave enough to take the first step. That's how I see it. Um, we were. It's not like we were both like, "What's happening? We want to figure this out. Let's let's really figure out this out for ourselves." So we were both already there. It's like you know, someone has to take that first step, or else nothing happens. It's like you got to take the first step and you know, start a podcast or else, cause it's a lot easier to be silent and not do anything. So, you know, it takes acts of bravery to, to go to the next level. And I don't know if I would have done that without Alex. So for that and to I'm, be fair, it all felt very accidental. <laughs> true. I was looking for a good story. <laughs> right. Heard about this letter. I love letters. Yeah. Who doesn't love mail? <laughs> <laughs> so no, but it was all like, it was crazy. It just, this it kind of just snowballed. It was just like a half hour of me starting a very beginning of a podcast, opening this letter. It was just so fast. And it's like, even like every time, like say I found out that we're, that I'm pregnant. It's like, I literally, it's like all those people that do the cute surprises. It's like, nope, I'm telling you right now because this, I just can't have this information. It's like, we just kind of share yeah. the weight of our ups, our downs, everything. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> So, um, so then there'll be people, and I know you don't care about what people think, but there'll be people who think, well, they're living the rock star life by this point and they just needed an out. Right. Can you talk about how hard that dark night of the soul, was it hard? And if so, what, what was, what was it like for you to have your kind of world fall apart? Was it hard? Yeah. I mean, that whole, that's or was what, it great or both? That's why we yeah. stayed in for so long. Is Again, of that, it's complicated. Yeah. yeah. It's that whole that's why we, I was th over 30 years old and had no idea about my ch own church. Mm -hmm. That's, it was that feeling of like not being a cliche and like it was annoying to me to even the idea of like being what you are basically preached not to do is when you get prideful, pride always comes before the fall and that's just, you know, slammed into you. So yeah, and that, that's, why do you think we stood in, you know, stayed in the church for so long? It was for that very reason that we didn't want to become that cliche. But I don't know. I, I think at a certain point you you, you have to be, it, yeah. It's just are you in a place where you're ready to hear the truth? And are you know? Because even if you can't lead a horse to water, if it's in, you, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make a drink. And that's I feel like that's true for us too. It's like I was open. I was in a place where I was open to hearing it. And uh, if people aren't in the place where they're open to hearing this stuff, then by all means, like, turn it off or, you know, do anything that makes you feel better about it. But uh, I think anyone who is still listening, it's like they've either been through this or else they're at least open enough to consider other possibilities. So that's who we're really here to speak to. But was it hard? Talk about what it was like to go through that. Yeah, they call it, it's called the dark night of the soul. Yeah. Was it that for you? And if so, how? I mean... Definitely. I think the people that I, it's just, it's kind of the foundation of your whole life. And it's not only this life, but what your next life is. And so that's big picture stuff. And to think that it's not what you thought. And then if you don't think that, what do you think about anything? And if you were wrong about that, then what else have you been wrong about? So yeah, it was grappling with that. And I think it took a little bit to you know, figure out, okay, so now who do I trust? If I don't have someone telling me, if I don't have a book that guides all this information for me, I, what I've intuition, I'm supposed to listen to that now. I thought it was the Holy ghost. And yeah, I mean, I think there was a lot of hard times. I mean, it, it was just kind of snowballing a little bit at the beginning. Yeah. We just looked at each other a lot and just like what's happening right now. Like, it was kind of hell for me. I mean, it was. It was a really dark time. And I, what, what was hard about it? I think the biggest thing was like, I think I think a certain way now about things and my family. I'm now separated from my family forever. It's, or at least there's going to be a wall there. Parents and siblings? Parents and siblings, yeah. I don't really, I mean, 
people will think what they want, but like I care a lot about what my siblings think of me because my siblings are all extremely good people. The, they're the best people I know. Uh, I'm the black sheep. I'm like, you know, <laughs> there I look up to all of them and who wants to be a black sheep, right? Exactly. And, and my parents, obviously, who I've, you know, the sermons, you adore them, right? I adore them. And the yeah. sermons are not disappointers in their parents. You know, it's, that's the big, a big thing is not to disappoint your parents. Like, uh, I was talking to, I'll say it. I hope he doesn't mind. I was talking to Robert before, and he told me that your, your dad or your parents bought the first touring bus yeah. for Imagine Dragons. Still own it. The dragon wagon. So what, well, you know, that was your dad, right? Yes. He's number one supporter of the band. He's our number one fan. I would dispute anyone uh, claiming that <laughs> but him uh yeah huge hugely supportive and who wants to who wants to disappoint that and yeah who who would who would and i i felt like he wouldn't look at me the same and it was just like how am i supposed to breach this gap what can i do like it's like half of me wanted to take the blue pill and just forget it all and half of me was glad that i i knew now and it was a really disruptive time and i just felt like a you know, I'm so grateful I had Alex to kind of help me through it. If I was going on on my own, I, you know, and thank goodness for you and listening to these Mormon stories because we would just like put the kids to bed, put the kids to bed. <laughs> and then, uh, we would make dinner together and put on a podcast and like hear from people who have gone through the same thing that we are going through now and have come out the other side and had a lot of really great advice. Uh, n- not the least of which was not the least of which was how to tell your family if you're going to tell your family. And how you reach that subject with your family, and that so that that was really helpful. And when I ultimately decided to do so, if somebody's learning about Mormon stories for the first time or other podcasts or whatever, are there any specific families or people that meant a lot to you that you would want to tell people to listen to if they're going through something similar? Any recommendations, or that's putting you on the spot to remember? I mean, I loved the one you did with uh, the Zelf on the Shelf. With Samantha and Tanner. Mm-hmm, yeah, the That affected Tyler, Tyler Glenn, too. Mm. Ta- the Tyler Glenn was one great, yeah. was amazing for us, and I feel like relatable for him. Mm-hmm. Um, Tom Phillips was a big one. Tom I, Phillips was a great one. I mean, there's just so many. Yeah. I Dan mean, Vogel, we really Dan just Vogel's devoured it. exhaustive, you know, retelling of just the amount of knowledge and was about Joseph Smith, and I think a really fair interpretation of what he, he might have been like as a person and... I thought it was really fascinating the amount of work he's done. It's it's really impressive. Jimmy Reynolds' yeah, interview Jimmy. was really great too. I, a lot of really good ones. Yeah, there's really so 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 many. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> that, love... that's not that's not to get praise. It's just it's sure, helpful no. for people to know. I mean, there's a thousand one hundred episodes right. right now. Right, it's crazy. So where do they start? <laughs> yeah, I also listened to Year of Polygamy, mm-hmm. um, which was insane and dark at times and um really powerful and enlightening and i i would suggest it to anyone who has uh questions about joseph smith's plug yeah i remember you telling me about that stuff and i like you would i I wouldn't listen to it all that much but you would and then you would tell me what was in it and i just my jaw would drop every episode my jaw would drop like these women were essentially treated like cattle or property and bandied about and traded you know from one husband to the next what those women endured under polygamy Ooh. That's that's enough to stop in your tracks, man. Yeah. Mm, okay. All right. So it was. So you you didn't want to disappoint your your parents and your siblings. Your whole life comes apart. So what did you guys do? Did you come out to everyone? Did you keep it quiet for no. a while? I mean, for a while, I think we just continued to research and just kind of like keep our head down and we kept really quiet about it. Like we said at the beginning, um, our two best friends were going through the same thing at the same time. And we saw them all the time and it's just, you didn't tell them. No, you know, why hurt their testimonies just because we lost ours. So, you know, I, I don't think we talked to anyone. I, I talked to strangers about it all the time though. I would go to (laughs) yoga and I would somehow bring it up with a stranger. I I don't even talk to strangers. I kind of social anxiety, if you can't tell, but very millennial uh, of me, but I, I would talk about it to everyone I possibly could that had no connection to Mormonism. And they were like, I don't know what you're saying. I mean, or I'd call my (laughs) high school friends and I'm like, Hey, remember that? Like those times you made fun of me. I mean, not seriously, like bullied me, but you know, teased me, but like, let's talk about that. And they're like, Okay, I have no frame of reference for anything you're saying. Yeah. But yeah, it was 
you know, I felt. Did you feel alone? Did you feel alone? Did you feel? Yes. I'm. Yes. In terms of not being able to like talk to my mom, I, I still talk to my mom a little bit, but, and she, when she converted to the church, she said she knew a lot of this information from like old church tapes. She said it was kind of more open, but I'm like, okay, well, you didn't share the information with me. Right. I didn't know. <laughs> yeah. So she's like, oh, you didn't know that? I'm like, no, mom, I did not know that. <laughs> um, so I, I would talk to her a little, but I was still very cautious. I'm still kind of cautious with my parents, just out of respect. And um, yeah, but I, I didn't really feel alone because we were talking about it together. That's everything. Like all, mm-hmm. all night, whenever we weren't working. Or, you and know. I'm, I'm, pretty act- I'm a pretty active lurker on the, the subreddit. Uh, Ex-Mormon subreddit. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've seen, I mean, not only on your show, but on on Reddit, that there's so many people that are going through this without the support of their spouse. And man, my heart really goes out to you, the people out there that are going through that by themselves. I cannot imagine uh, having these existential doubts about arguably the most important things in the universe and not being able to share your perspective with the person you're supposed to love the most. That to me would be like purgatory. So... I really feel for those people. Yeah, like I, if I really wanted to stay in it after all this information, I think you would probably just suck it up, mm-hmm. and vice versa. Just because, you know, it's like you have built a life together, and then now I, it's, you kind of got to be on the same page as the for this. Yeah, I can't imagine. Hmm. Okay. So, you you kept it kind of to yourselves, but you were in a good place. And that would have been, that's 2014, that's five years ago. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I remember when you, you, you're, you said, an email came through, and I'm like, oh, wow, Wayne Sermon, who's that? You know, because mm-hmm. I'd known Imagine Dragons, but right. I didn't. So I've known about that you were a listener for at least four or five mm-hmm. years. Yeah, we felt after, we were like, we've probably listened to 300 hours. I think we should donate. <laughs> so you, you sent in a donation. Thank you. You don't know me, but I know you. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciated that. That was great. Yeah. But, but I mean, that's so many years between then and now. So, I mean, that's, that know. was a, at least a year of not saying anything to anybody. Yeah. Yeah. And then finally talking to like my friends, Andrew and Brittany talking to Dan and his wife Asia about it a little bit. Okay. So uh, eventually it took a year. Wait, let me just get this straight. You guys went a year not believing without talking to Dan Reynolds, your, <laughs> your group partner. Yeah. Is that right? Probably. Or maybe a little less, but I don't know. But I mean, it's probably something like that. And, and without talking to your best friends, uh-huh. isn't that crazy? Yeah. What is it? I mean, <laughs> so I mean, you know, maybe I would have if I didn't have Alex. But, I just, but yeah, yeah. You, you don't feel like it's it's your it's place to overstep. It's like who are you to step on someone's testimony? And if they want, to, I've always been the kind of person that's like, you live your truth. I'm not going to step on right. on your ability to think whatever you want. So. A lot of it was that too. What do you want to say about when you finally were felt comfortable coming out to Dan in Asia and how that was? Was it like a awesome bond? Was it like cathartic? Was it? It was more just like uh, I just said to Dan, like, "Hey, are you where? Where's where? Where's your head with the church?" Because I knew, you know, the the lyrics to his albums are, you know, like I know I know him and I know I can read between the lines pretty easily with him and where he's at. And there's not a lot of secrets there. Um, I think, I don't remember the conversation. I think it was just like, I think we might have talked about Mormon stories or the CS letter. And he's like, yeah, I read it. Mm. I was like, what, what do you mean you read it? Mm -hmm. I think he read it even before I did. And it's just like, he didn't, I don't think he felt like coming to me about it either. You know, I think it was a two way thing. And was there a big relief when you found out you guys were on the same page? It was, it was, I mean, it's like, it's like meeting someone who's also Mormon. You have that. Oh, it's like, we have the same. You know, it's like we have something in common. <laughs> and then now it's like, oh, you read the CES letter. Okay, we're on the same page. Yeah. You know, you know some stuff. I know some stuff. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it a was lo- a big relief. Yeah. And Asia, were, were you guys able to talk about it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah she's yeah, really open-minded. Mm-hmm. She's person, really open-minded. So. She's, she's a, a convert. convert yeah. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I think it was a really positive experience to just be able to, you know, it's it's just one of those things where you're like, how have we not talked about this? Yeah, and then and they're obviously in their own place with it now, and right. And I'm not, I not, yeah, them. and I'm not sure where they are exactly, and that's their personal 
journey, but it's just refreshing to be able to be open. And there are definitely people that we can always be open with about this. And there's no uh, taboo subject, which we're really grateful for. So I, I remember every once in a while, a re- ex-Mormon Reddit post would come up that's like, here's some lyrics to an Imagine Dragons song. It sounds like Dan might be going through a faith crisis, <laughs> but we're not, you know, people weren't sure. Right. But that was mostly the third album, right? Not the yeah. second? Oh, a lot of the second. It was but, second and third, I guess. But but people were speculating about it in the second. I know, I know that that was informing the second album. Right. But in my mind, it wasn't until the third album where people were like really going, wait a minute. Yeah. Is something unraveling here? Mm. It, but is that not what you experienced? Were people, did you have people come to you and say, wait a minute, these lyrics in the second album, there's something going on here? Yeah. In the second okay. album, we had that a little bit okay, for okay. sure. And I think he was still going through that. I think it's still an evolution for him too. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And so I think it's probably the same feelings he had in the second album. I think some of those same feelings he's having for the third and obviously, you know, in his creation of Love Loud, you know, I think I think it's really smart to try and affect change from inside. That's really the only way that you're going to have effective change is if you, you know, don't attack something but try and change it and you believe in something and just want to see it get better. So I really appreciate his perspective on it. Uh, it's not necessarily one I can... 100% share I just it's for some reason I essentially I've my records are off the church and I I had to get to a place where I just resigned from the whole organization and I felt way more com- confident in that decision than you know any anything inside the church so so before I follow up on that let me just ask so there you know in non-mormonism and just like mainstream Christianity whether it's Catholicism Presbyterians Methodist Lutheran mm-hmm. it's not like this it's just like right. None of us take the Bible too seriously. None of us mm-hmm. take be, become a Presbyterian, become a Methodist. Like, who cares? You're Christian. It's It informs your life. It's not who you are. And just be a buffet, whatever you are. Take what you like. Leave what you don't. And just, you know, like the salt. It's mm-hmm. it's not the meal. It's just the savoring. Be a, be a buffet, whatever you are, right? right. Mm-hmm. And Mormonism, of course, we grew up in a time where that was never a possibility. We grew up, maybe I did, I don't know about you, but like Bruce R. McConkey, all or nothing, it's either everything or it's a fraud. It's either all true or a fraud. Mm-hmm. That's what I grew up in. Are you saying that's what you grew up in? Absolutely. So, so I know that it wasn't, um, that wasn't necessarily viewed as a possibility. Having said that, um, I also think that by 2000 and, you know, 13, 14, 15, models were starting to emerge of progressive Mormonism. Mm-hmm. The Givenses were coming out with their stuff and and Bushman was sticking in and apologetics, neo-apologetics started mm-hmm. emerging with Patrick Mason and, and that kind of stuff. Right. Thomas McConkey. So did you guys just consider, wait a minute, what, okay, Yes, we were taught the binary true-false paradigm. Yes, it, we were taught the all-or-nothing thing. But we can be a first generation. And in some sense, your dad was a first generation <laughs> of just like, why not Why not just be cultural buffet Mormons that didn't leave, um, didn't weren't orthodox, but just did Mormonism on your own terms? Did you consider that? And if so, what happened? I've actually thought a lot about this subject. Um, all, I want to hear all about it. So, I think a lot has to do with my personality, but I, the way I've, I see it is Mormonism is essentially trying to be like Judaism or Islam. And what I mean by that is like Islam and, and uh, Judaism were wilderness religions, right? They, like the very characteristics of when they were made is what, is what defines it. So, uh, they were made in the wilderness where it's not only a religion, like that's part of it, but it's also your culture, it's your laws, it's what you eat, it's this dress. Thing, you know what I mean? It's how you dress. It's this whole encompassing thing. And Islam's the same way. Like it's like these like religions that were built in isolation. So Mormonism, I think, is tries to become that. I think that's one way to describe it. It's like it's this one stop shop. Like don't worry about anything. We this is the kind of underwear you wear. This is you know. What you do on Sundays. What you don't eat, what you eat. What you eat, what you don't eat. This is what, and what you don't drink. Um, this is what you do on Mondays. This is what your the Saturdays are going to look like with the service. It's like this whole like thing where it's just like you just, it's all there for you. And it's taken care of just like these like wilderness religions that are really old. But that's just the thing. Like that's the difference. 
I feel like, and my problem is that, that maybe I can get past, maybe you, you have input on this, but <laughs> for me, Mormonism, Mormonism doesn't have this like grand underpinning like of millennia that it, where it's like this race of people and it's this pride and it's this thing, you know, with Mormonism, like you can, you can like look down the road and you can see the con happening. You can, these people wrote things down. It wasn't that long ago. And it wasn't that long ago. So there's a record. You're saying right. there's a record, not, a and, written record. And I'm not saying, I, 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 just to be clear, I think is Islam and Judaism are just as false as far as like supernatural claims as Mormonism. It's, I, I see them as the same, but... And oddly, Mormons would be okay with that. It's okay that <laughs> right. Islam and Judaism right. don't have it right. <laughs> and so I see Christian... And, and I think even Christianity in general, like it just is a different thing than the other two religion, big religions because if you look at Christianity and where it was made, it, it doesn't have quite that gravity to it because it was made when... Uh, the Roman Empire was already there to, for laws and for culture in some respects. And yeah, you can live within that, but it's not this all-encompassing thing like Christianity in itself isn't even that. Like, It's like... There's, can, no, there's no dietary code right. in, in the New Testament. Catholicism is, gets close and it's one of the oldest you know, examples of Christianity, but like, it's still not, it's not the same thing. And so Mormonism, I think, wants to claim that, that sort of structure without really... The millennia to like get behind it and I just, and that's the part for me it's like that's eventually why i decided it's like the foundations of the thing for me are the problem and the fact that i can see them being made falsely it really just ruins the whole thing for me you know the whole thing is built on a, on, a, on sand for me so that's why i have a really hard time with like we'll just be cultural go to church yeah you don't really believe it but like no like the whole foundation of this church is based on what joseph smith saw and his uh, being truthful in his accounts. That, that's the bread and butter. That's, as Hinckley said, either this is, either he saw these things or they didn't and this thing is a fraud. And sadly, I've come to the second conclusion. And so that's why I, you know, I see the merits of religion. Obviously, I see the merits of Mormonism and all the good that it does, but I just can't get myself. It's just not who I am to like be able to just be like, oh, you know, it's not true, but let's just... Like, there's better things for me to build a foundation on. Like, if you're going to go to church, then, then this man. So for you, it's a sandy foundation. Yeah. It's not a solid foundation. How about for you, Alex? Because we've talked about on Mormon Stories this idea of validity Mormons and utility Mormons. A validity Mormon is like, it's true or false. Mm -hmm. And I'm in it because it's true. And if it's not true, then I'm out because it's false. A utility Mormon is like, well, it works for me. It's a great place. It helps keep my marriage strong. It's a great place to raise kids. It makes me a better person. Mm -hmm. And so I'm a Mormon because it makes me happy and it makes me a better person and it's good for my life. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes it's the woman who's more of a utilitarian and it's it's the man who cares more about validity. How mm -hmm. has it been for you? I guess I'm the man. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I don't know if it, it, it's not like it was working for me to begin with. And I felt like that's why we're strong. That's why our kids are good people. I, I, I look at my kids and I see that they're good because they genuinely don't want to hurt another person. I, and they don't know who Jesus is actually. Uh, someone told, asked who this was in a picture and we said, Oh, it's Jesus. And River's like Chuck E. Cheese's like <laughs> he just really has no idea, but yet those same like Christ-like attributes that are described in the Bible I, I see in him and it's not because we go to church and he's taught that it's just because we're a strong family and he genuinely just chooses right I guess uh, I mean except when he doesn't but <laughs> so I don't know I just felt like it just I couldn't commit to something that I just didn't believe in I just I have a really hard time I I can't really put on a false face about something I if I think something I say it I um I as Daniel could tell you I'm a really bad liar I I can't even hide a Christmas present it's <laughs> just I'm I'm not gonna say I believe something that I don't and I feel like when you go to church and you're a Mormon I that's what you do. I mean, you go up on the stand and you say it and otherwise you're 
you're an other and I, I don't want to go and I didn't want to be an other. I didn't want our kids to be treated like others. And so I didn't feel like it was right for our family. So how, uh, there, there's, there's kind of two considerations that, um, and I was, I was talking to Robert about this too. There's kind of two big considerations about like going from that point where you no longer believe and, and can't attend and, and even take your name off the record and coming on a Mormon stories podcast episode, right? Mm -hmm. That's, that's different. And, and even you talked about not wanting in, and, and I think that's still the intent, not trying to take people's faith away. We're not trying to get people out of the church. We still love the church. We still love Mormons. I do. I know you do. So, um, I can think of at least two big considerations, maybe three when, when you try and decide whether or not to do an interview like this, right? Um, one is, uh, actually I'm going to pause, I guess before then there's coming out to your family. Mm. Oh, we haven't done that. <laughs> Oops. <No. laughs> that let's talk about that. And then we'll talk about sure. th this interview. So let's talk about telling family how and when, how long did you wait for that? Two years. Okay. Maybe more, maybe Was two and three? a half. We told them last year. Man, I I just blinked and I'm 35. Honestly, like <laughs> I I don't know why I can't remember any dates. <laughs> so that's four stuff. years. I mean, yeah. 2014. Last year's 18. Yeah. Let's say okay. short. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. What? It was when we were on that, tour last year. Yes. Last summer. I just go day to day, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you went anywhere between two and four years without telling family. Yes. Yeah. And, w and you were just scared, right? Yeah, and I had a lot of uh, anxiety about that, to be honest. And the reason I ultimately ended up wanting to tell them was I thought it would make me feel a little bit better about everything. Cause so you're sitting with this, yeah, everyone's I was, thinking one thing, but you're feeling exactly. something else. And that feels like what? It was starting to become a problem for me. Like The problem is that in the absence of a narrative, they could very well make up their own. And what's wrong with that? Uh, I think... The biggest thing that's wrong with that is that they're they can fill in the gaps with the with any cliche they want. Like, um, I, and I know that my family, my siblings, they they love me, and they I don't I'm not saying that they thought I was somehow a bad person at any point in this, but I just didn't I just wanted to get to get my own control of the narrative because I didn't I wanted to let them know that I I wasn't leaving for any of the reasons that they might think where money, success, fame, pride. Um, not needing it anymore and just, you know, becoming some kind of intellectual that's too good for it or can, you know, any of those reasons. I, the only reason I told them is because I, I couldn't have that be said, a, a thought of me. Uh, to the world, I don't really care. But to my siblings and my mom and my dad, I do care. And so ultimately, I ended up telling them. And I followed, you know, a lot of the advice that you give to do it. You know, I, I, said, I, I kept it somewhat quick and didn't write put it in writing didn't put it in writing i just called each each person individually um because we were in different states and just said you know i try to do as lovingly as possible and say i love you guys and uh i know this can be a really huge hit and it's a really hard thing for you to hear and for me to say but um i don't believe in mormonism anymore and i've left the church and i just you know nothing else has changed still love you guys and i know you love me and you know, I think a really good idea is to have some healthy boundaries with what we talk about and how we talk about it. I'm always happy to s speak about religion. There's no subject that's off topic for me. Um, but I know that, you know, you might not want to. And so if you want to talk to me about it, that's great. But it's, I just want to let you know it's going to be a two-way dialogue. And uh, Don't so, bring it up if you don't <laughs> want to talk about it. That's right. And so uh, and, and I, the last thing I want to say is I will not be a... Uh, cautionary tale for this family. It will not be a cautionary tale for your kids. Meaning what? Uh, to look what happens when you lose faith and that you have when you get success in your life and you get prideful and look look what can happen to a person you know as great as he was that he can leave a church. That's how powerful the devil is or whatever. That kind of stuff I just won't have said of me. And I don't think my siblings would, of course. But like I just want I, I just want to make it really clear that like. The reason I'm leaving, leaving is because of the history of the church and the actual doctrine that I think is false. That's that's it. It's not the other stuff. 
that you think that other people might think it is. Not that I don't think any of my siblings. I mean, they're really right. charitable people, and I, I think I was overly worried, honestly, because their responses were over, overwhelmingly positive. Every one of my siblings proved to be even better than I thought they were as people because they said, we totally understand, we love you, you're still our brother, you're always going to be our brother. And I think they were probably shocked by it all, but uh, I think I should have given, in hindsight, I should have given them more credit than I did. Um, because as much of this weight that Mormonism has to it, and maybe people hearing this are like, this seems so silly, like... You know, people that, that aren't super religious or that aren't raised yeah, Mormons. Mormons don't get that. They don't get this. And I totally get that. But um, for for me, it was like so validating to know that they chose me over their religion. And they would never shun me and they'd never uh, not invite me to a family activity. It's like, no, you're still our brother. Like, it's all good. Like, And I was prepared for them never not to ask any questions about my perspective Luckily, because they didn't. <laughs> it's like, you know, I, I still couldn't help but think like, well, if it was me, wouldn't I want to ask like, well, but what happened? Though? What happened? Why? What did you find out? Like, You're what? smart. I trust you. Like, yeah, what yeah. happened? But no, it's it's radio silence on that front end. That was probably the most surprising part. Yeah, and, but that's totally fine. And that's I understand. so normal. It's the yeah, most normal totally. of all things. It's still so crazy. They don't want to know. Yeah. Because yeah, they're happy. Yep. Yeah. Or happy enough. Or, mm -hmm. Yeah. They don't want Which is great. To. Yeah. What about, do you want to share anything about how it was with your parents? You uh, my parents, I talked to my dad in person and, you know, he's, uh, how to describe him? He's, he's one of the greatest people I've ever known and if not the greatest person. And he, you know, obviously he holds, you know, a high position in the church and he's a state president. It, it could, yeah. It could look bad for him or, you know, maybe, you know, you think maybe he'd be worried about that and like, you know, this stain on the family and you know, potential other leadership positions or anything like he, at the end of the day, he doesn't care about any of this stuff. He, he was totally supporting and said, I understand and it doesn't matter. And I love you and you'll always be my son. And, uh, only really the only thing that mattered to him is that I was still the person that he raised. And, um, and I said to him, look, I, I firmly believe I'm a good person, not because of the church. I'm a good person because of you and mom and that you happen to put a lot of care into raising five kids. And that's the reason we're good. And so don't give the church too much credit on this. I think, you know, I, I'm going to continue to be a good person. I'm going to be faithful to my wife. I, you know, I'm going to be, I'm going to be as good a father as I can be. And nothing's going to change on that front. That's, that's the only concern he, is he, he had is that I wouldn't fly out the deep end as, you know, you hear sometimes happens when people leave religion. It's like, even growing up, like in Utah, it's like, there's just like weird thing you probably noticed too is like, there's not like any in between, like when kids rebel in Utah, they rebel hard. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's not much like. They want to become the opposite of whatever the Mormon, opposite. Is, Mormon exactly. is. It's, not, it's opposite. not like, you know, this isn't for me, you know, just on an intellectual level. Um, <laughs> I'm still totally with you guys and I still, the morals are great. <laughs> it's like, ah, I'm going to get a tattoo. And, you it's know, like the Catholic that. school girl thing. <laughs> exactly. It's like yeah. when you rebel, you rebel hard. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me more about that. No. Um, <laughs> yeah. So. It, where was I? Yeah. That, that's distracting. So really you basically distracted. told your dad that you're going to yeah, still sorry. be the same old Daniel. Yes. Yep. And he's totally cool with that. My mom was probably the hardest to tell. Family is everything, and she's a really sweet. And you know, fam family is everything. Grew to her. up in Lehigh. Yeah. And lived in American Fork her whole life. Mm -hmm. And just really believes in that. Like I think you know, the whole fact that there's a possibility that we, we may not like, be together as a family forever. That was. That's the thing that I think really upset her. And so she was really emotional and I tried to be as consoling as I could. And, uh, but it was really difficult, but I just felt like it's something I had to do. And I'm glad I did it. I think it ended up being a overall positive thing to do. Just, you know, clear the air a little bit and just to get on the same page. And ever since then, it's been fine. It doesn't really come up at all. It's never, um, been a, a topic that's been, reached since then really in any crazy manner so and that's totally fine and the more time passes the more i don't care and i'm super happy with them being mormon and if it works for them then i'm super glad and i'm not just saying that i genuinely don't care if they believe, if they think the, way, the same way i do because you can't live your life like that and are you still feeling welcome in your family oh 100 are you feeling like a disappointment you, you said did you say black sheep or yeah i, I had worries about that yeah 
but I don't feel that way. I really? Feel, I don't know. So it's kind of a happy ending yeah. with, with the family. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> They're awesome. And we're totally cool and no issues. That's yeah. great. That's and rare. Actually. It really feels like nothing has changed and like... They're like the only people that haven't treated me differently through like all the fame and success and all that stuff. They're just, they just still give me a hard time and I'm still just like the runty younger brother and, you know. You're cool with that. I'm, they're going to wrestle me to the ground. You're I don't, scrappy though. I'm scrappy. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and I love that. That's great. 